Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Senior Director of Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and I'm happy to welcome you today to today's program on improving organizational health for greater impact. This program is part of a joint project of JFN and Upstart called Granted that was launched just over a year ago to help strengthen the relationships between grant makers and grant seekers. In addition to organizing monthly programs such as this one, we host facilitated conversations and Granted offers a wide variety um, of tools, articles, and case studies and other resources on our website, jgranted.org. And I encourage you all to visit it after this program. Uh, today, we have time together to explore improving organizational health for greater impact. A healthy organization is not only more sustainable and impactful, but is also a better place to work. Today, we will learn about how grant makers and grant seekers can partner together to improve organizational health and in turn strengthen the Jewish communal field. Amy Tobin, consultant on organizational development, will share recommendations for aligning values, culture, capacity, and priorities so that organizations are better equipped to positively impact their communities. We will also be able to hear from Edith Klein, president and CEO of Keshet, and Liana Krupp, president and trustee of the Krupp Family Foundation, who will reflect on their own grant maker grant seeker partnership and how they collaborate to prioritize organizational health. health. And now, without further ado, I want to pass it over to Amy Tobin to get us started and to, to share, um, share with us today. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, Tamar. It's great to be here. And, um, you know, I have a background in performing. It's sure hard when I can't see all your faces, but I hope you all just smile for a moment, take a deep breath, and appreciate that we could be here all together. Um, before we get into the discussion with Edith and Liana, I'm going to give a little bit of how I think about organizational health. And Alana, if you want to go ahead and bring up that first slide, you can just while I start talking. So first, a little bit about how I've gotten here. We can go to the second slide, um, which has a photo of me. So you get two of me. I have uh, worked with dozens of organizations across the nonprofit field. I was most recently the CEO of the JCC of the East Bay. And before that, I was the founding executive director of the David Brower Center in Berkeley. And one was a startup and one was a legacy institution. And uh, before and after, I worked with a lot of arts, social justice, environmental justice, and um, social service organizations around strategic planning, organizational health, organizational development. And um, because I've worked with so many organizations across the field, my work has allowed me to see trends and patterns. And some of those are unique to the Jewish communal field and some are true across the nonprofit universe. I have a special connection to the Jewish community, even though I continue to work with organizations in other sectors. So I've synthesized the trends that I've seen in my practice and the framework that we're starting with today. And I wanna say that I love working with people who want to change systems. And I also work with people who know we need to make changes but aren't sure where to start. I also wanna be clear that my approach and the way that I think about organizational development is not original and that I stand on the shoulders of the many people I've learned from. Those include people doing organizational work like Jennifer McClanahan Flint, Gamal Palmer, uh, I've done training with nonviolent communication practitioners, colleagues who work for gender equity and racial justice. I learned a great deal from a group that I facilitated of executive directors in a leadership cohort in 2020. And I have to say, I've learned so much from the boards and staffs and funders that I collaborated with when I was in a leadership position. I learned uh, around racial justice training with Desiree Attaway, and I want to give a shout out to the Joshua Venture Fellowship, which of course became part of Upstart, and Eliza Mazur, who was faculty back in 2001. Um, so know that I don't think much of what I say will seem original, but I want to give a framework for thinking about healthy organizations and healthy relationships. And today we're specifically talking about the relationships between grant makers and grant seekers. So if we can go to the next slide. I think it might help to define organizational health. When I talk about it, I think about an organization whose work is sustainable and sustaining. That means that we take care of the people doing the work, that we respect everyone's contributions and everyone's needs as partners in the work. 
And when I say sustainable, I also mean that we're realistic about what's possible and what advances a mission most. Sustainable also means that the impact inside the organization is as important as the work outside. And these distinctions of inside and outside don't serve us. We're in the business of serving communities and the community includes those within the organization. And I wanna give a shout out to Edith, uh, who's here to talk with us today for helping to cement this idea when we were preparing for this webinar. So that means that to be healthy, we have to focus on the, on the humanity of the people around us, on each other and tend to our relationships. And it also means that to be healthy, we have to focus on alignment across the organization. I have five pages open on my computer and one of them just changed. So I'm gonna find where I was because I really wanna to get to talking with Liana and Edith. So if we have alignment across the organizational system, that means that we have consistent values and practices across hierarchy, across power, across influence, across difference and across roles. So if we wanna consider how to have a healthy organization, we need to look at how we work. How we work is the foundation for service, impact, or advancing a mission. So let's go to the next slide. Many of us know that we need to change how we work. I take this for granted in my work, but I realize that maybe I should pause and say why we need to change how we work. I think many of you here probably know we need to. We feel it in our bodies. We learned it during COVID. We see it when we talk about staff retention and feedback. And how we work is not just a set of personal habits, it's about what we agree to, about how we communicate and what we expect of ourselves and each other. And yeah, you can look at this through the lens of productivity and success. You know, the evidence that we need to change is all around us. I'm, uh, I'm not saying anything new. We know burnout is pervasive in the nonprofit field, and that includes the Jewish communal field. We know that ideas of professionalism were formed at a time when the white collar workforce was homogenous and didn't consider parents or women or racial diversity or the needs of people with disabilities to name a few. And we know that blue collar or essential or non-exempt vocations, within those disempowerment for workers has always almost been the norm. And at the same time, over the last 20 plus years, the nonprofit sector has professionalized and focused on metrics and deliverables. And in some cases that eliminated the dysfunctional family dynamics that some of us knew in the Jewish communal or nonprofit field. But in other ways, this professionalism might have elevated private sector practices that left our humanity behind. But I think that the reason we need to change how we work is very simply because we should care about communal health. Many of our accepted ways of working are not sustainable, equitable, or human-centered. I think we need to change how we work because organizations have the potential to truly embody Jewish values. There's this intersection between avodah, service and work, and chesed, caring. So, what are the ingredients of a healthy organization? Let's go to the next slide. Uh, skip this and we'll go to the next one because they're a little out of order. There we go. This is a tool that I use when I consider how we work. We're not gonna go into detail with it today because I wanna get to our case study and I'm happy to talk about it in more depth or if you have questions, but in broad strokes, these are some of the ways to think about a healthy organization. A healthy organization is one that is intentional about culture. So for example, how we have meetings, how we share expectations, how we set priorities, how we do planning, how we're accountable, how we celebrate, we need to be explicit and proactive about these practices and norms. Many of the ones that we inherited as leaders may or may not be serving us or our organizations. You know, for example, if you think about capacity and expectations, how many of your organizations or grantees are trying to do more than they can with their current staff or resources? What's the impact on the staff and the community? If there aren't enough staff or staff are underpaid, what needs to change? Do we just continue or do we reprioritize? 
you know, in the same vein to the staff, the board, the funders, the constituents all know and share the same priorities. In a healthy organization, everyone knows what's most important, even if it changes from time to time. That means what kind of planning has taken place and who is at the table for this planning. So in my mind, organizational health is not just a set of values. It's about how you operationalize those values. And on the right side, I have how culture is a mindset. How do we get explicit about power in our relationships, about how power might affect folks' ability to be honest or direct or equitable? So as you're looking at these, I'm curious which relationships you've been thinking about. Are you thinking this is about how the CEO or executive director works with their staff, how they celebrate achievements? Are you thinking about how staff communicate with each other and are accountable to each other? Are you thinking about the grantee grant maker relationship and how that can be applied to these ideals? So if we go back a slide, Alana. This is where alignment across the system becomes so important. A healthy organization does not exist just within the staff ecosystem. It doesn't even exist just within the staff and board ecosystem. The same values and practices need to be in place and explicit across the system with funders, with the community, because this is a human system. These are all people working together toward a common purpose hopefully for positive communal change. So imagine making change throughout these relationships. In my practice, I work on these in a variety of ways. I work with CEOs and their boards and their board chairs on how they work together. I work with leadership teams on how they work together. I work with executive directors on how they work alone. But today we're focusing on the grant maker and the grant seeker. So what would happen if everyone within this ecosystem was in alignment around organizational capacity, what you can do and your expectations? What if everyone was working from the same shared values? What if everyone was willing to reflect on power and privilege and how some people are treated differently within an organization? Can everyone's time and expertise be equally valued? Can executives be transparent with funders about what they can and cannot do? Can staff be transparent with the board, funders, community, and each other about what they can and cannot do? So if we go back one more time, Alana, yeah. What's the funder's role in helping to make this healthy relationship, this healthy organization? What can we change within the relationship between the grantee and the funder? The chief executive and the funder have a unique opportunity to model a working relationship that might be possible throughout the system, examining power, working collaboratively, communicating, being clear and flexible about expectations. So if you're interested, if you're the kind of person who's interested in innovation or the future of work, this unique relationship between the grant maker and the grant seeker is a great place to start. So we can close this slide out and learn a little bit about one relationship as a case study. And I recognize that when we start talking with Edith and with Liana, their relationship is unique. We're not suggesting that everybody replicate it, but we think there may be some takeaways and how they built their relationship, how they communicate with each other and how they collaborate to create a healthy organization. So with that, we're gonna make a transition here to just me talking to all three of us talking. If we could see Edith and Liana's faces, there they are. I've loved talking with the two of them in preparation. And uh, before we start, I'm wondering if each of you can just say a little bit about what you do within your organization or your foundation and uh, how long you've been working together. Indeed, did you wanna start? Sure, thanks so much, Amy. Um, and thanks to all of you for inviting Liana and me to be your case study today. Um, so I'm the CEO of Keshet, um, uh, which is an organization I started building uh, back in September 2001, and it's an organization that works for LGBTQ equality in Jewish life. Um, we do that um, through three major ways, um, through um, giving Jewish community leaders and staff in Jewish institutions across the country the skills and the tools that they need to create communities of equality and belonging themselves. 
Um, we work directly with queer Jewish teens, giving them the space to just be themselves and be celebrated and loved for who they are. Um, and then thirdly, and very importantly, given what's happening in the political climate today, we work to mobilize Jewish communities to fight for LGBTQ civil rights in the public sphere. Um, and I had the um, great pleasure of meeting Liana back in 2016, and uh, we haven't really taken much of a break since then. Thanks, Adit, and thanks everyone for being here today and for hosting us. Um, Liana Krupp, she, her, hers, I'm the president and a board member trustee of the Krupp Family Foundation, which is based in Boston, Massachusetts, although I reside in Venice, California. Um, uh, Krupp Family Foundation focuses on building strong organizations that support healthy, thriving communities. 40% uh, of our giving is specifically mandated towards Jewish life. Um, and the remainder sort of falls into a guiding principle that we prioritize historically um, marginalized communities that have been left out of opportunity. I am so sorry, there's my dog. Uh, I knew he was gonna show up at some point. Um, there, uh, we, we try to focus on uh, funding organizations that have been historically left out of funding opportunities, uh, whether that's in the LGBTQ space, um, BIPOC-led organizations, grassroots and movement work. Um, we come to our funding relationship with Cash It as an ally family, meaning that uh, everyone in our immediate family identifies as cisgendered, meaning female born, female identifying, or male born, male identifying, and heterosexual. So a lot of this work is driven by a fight for the future of more equality and more inclusion, as well as honoring um, honoring my husband's uncle who passed away in the 90s, who was gay and, and sort of doing this in his memory. Um, and it's been, uh, Keshet has been one of our largest grantees and has been a, in its own way, a great teaching source on how we do our philanthropy. Uh, and I will, I'll save the details for some of these questions. Thanks to both of you. So we thought we might start out by talking about how your relationship began, your professional relationship began. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what you each did to create trust and collaboration with each other in the beginning. And Edith, I'm curious to hear about that. And um, this may not be what you, Liana might not be the only person that you approached the beginning of a relationship with this way. So hearing a little bit about how you start uh, relationships with new partners. Sure. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, I'd say my relationship with Liliana is special and the way I approached it um, is the way I approach um, really kind of every relationship in my life, which is um, wanting to understand and, you know, get to know the person sitting opposite me. So, you know, when Liana and I first met for coffee uh, six years ago, um, you know, we, you know, both you know, asked each other questions, which essentially, essentially elicited one another's kind of life stories and motivations of, you know, what were the key, you know, moments in our lives, you know, what were the moments that moved us, that scared us, that inspired us, that, you know, fueled our journeys, you know, to get us to that moment. Um, you know, and of course, when I'm having those conversations um, within the, within a professional context, you know, I'm doing so with an eye towards hoping that the conversation um, organically is guided towards a place in which we arrive at kind of a shared set of motivations and commitments around LGBTQ equality. Um, sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't, you know, and when it doesn't, it means you know, this isn't going to be a leader or this isn't going to be a donor, um, you know, and thankfully, you know, in, in, in this case, uh, it did. And she became a donor, leader, and friend. The dog. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting because, you ready, Liana? Oh, yes. Yeah, Sorry. He, want, he wanted to answer for me. Um, I think it, it really comes down to sort of that, that general human curiosity, curiosity about the other person. And, and coming at it with authentic questions and not just sort of being business first through it and finding ways to connect authentically and uh, follow up questions and, and realizing what parts of your personal life, your professional life sort of intersect and just 
it, sometimes it's as simple as remembering people's birthdays or life events and, and just acknowledging that outside of sort of the traditional work context. Um, Adit and I both have children that are roughly the same age. And uh, so we've always been able to sort of connect beyond work as mothers who are navigating, running organizations and trying to, to raise the next generation of leaders and, and thoughtful human beings. And, I, you know, and she is someone that I value deeply in sort of navigating that, especially from uh, like a Jewish life perspective. I too have a dog. <laughs> He's, Much only not, he's only not barking at the moment. <laughs> so there's a way that you, I have a dog too, who hopefully will not bark. <laughs> uh, what you're doing is you know that there is this um, desired outcome. You know, could there be a potential partnership for the benefit of Keshet and its community and the Jewish community at large? And you're also seeing each other as humans interested in each other's life stories, who you are, what you care about. And yeah, you're looking for shared for commonality. So this curiosity about each other is fundamentally grounded in humanity. It's not just about what can we get done together. So I'm curious then if we sort of transition, you get to know each other, you come with this curiosity and this caring and this interest, you do find you have some personal intersections as well. And then you begin a grant making relationship. And Liana, I'm curious what some of the concrete approaches to grant making have been that allowed Keshet to pursue organizational health specifically. And I guess we're jumping over in time. So if as we get to that, you want to tell a little bit about um, what motivated you to begin to participate in Keshet and then why you cared about these organizational health related initiatives and what they were. Absolutely. Um, my I was first introduced to Keshet through um, uh, some friends at CJP, one of which Patty Jacobson was being honored at uh, Keshet's uh, annual Outstanding Gala. Uh, so that sort of caught my interest and, and I sort of struggled in Jewish communal life in the sense that I converted, I, I, was, um, I had a lot of very warm welcomes from very powerful people and never really felt like I found, authentically found my people uh, in my work. And, you know, these were trusted colleagues at CJP who introduced me to Keshet and, um, you know, we showed up for Patty, we got to know Keshet and it sort of evolved from there when I stepped into my role um, as, uh, as the first full-time staff member for the foundation, uh, we sort of discussed like, here are all the different things that we can do in the Jewish world. And I still sort of have this like jaw to the floor moment when my father-in-law said to me, um, you find one thing, you focus on it, you become a leader in that. And he said, it's LGBTQ. And I was just shocked because, you know, again, we're an ally family and, uh, you know, there, he is someone who's very big into day schools, who is, who is, very politically driven. And I was just, just so taken and so impressed with that trust, not just for me, but for Kesha. And uh, from there, I, I do want to start with saying when we started working with Kesha, they were in an organizationally healthy space, and um, which is very helpful in those decision making processes of we're not, we're, making, we're not making a huge risk here with something that uh, a sector that we might not know a lot about or have lived experience in, but have the confidence that this is an organization that has been around at that point about 15 years and, um, and runs a tight ship. And we have over the years, they were the first uh, multi-year grant that we did because we were helping with strategic planning, um, some web design, and some projects that just, they needed, they needed the confidence that they can get over the front finish line. And then that was right before we started doing our first ever strategic plan in 2018. And from there, we sort of took that model and teased it out of any grant that we're investing six figures in should be a multi-year grant. And here we are, I think we're committed out until 2024, 2025. Um, and, and now the conversation is shifting in how we can use this as an example of how we, we can build our legacy 
um, as leaders in a sector, as leaders within organizations. Uh, so that has, has deeply informed how we move in our Jewish work, outside of our Jewish work, and just how we really can show up in, in trusting organizations to make decisions for their organizational health. So there's a certain amount of trust that Kesha knew what it needed and you wanted to support it through multi-year operating support. And I, it's interesting, the idea that for you, you said, you know, it seemed like they were an organization that was healthy, they ran a tight ship, and it raises an interesting question if you encounter an organization where maybe the ship doesn't seem as tight, but it still seems important to invest, how those, how this, this, these same kinds of relationships can develop when things feel maybe riskier or an organization needs some support at an earlier stage of development, right? Absolutely, or, yeah. and, and it, it gives us a really great model to, to balance against of uh, being able to, because we have this trusted partnership, I find myself in a situation with another grantee who might need some advice, that needs the direction around a strategic plan or needs, needs to be thinking about how their organizational structure looks different. I have a resource in Adit and her team to sort of find out how they got there. They have the experience. How can I create connections between organizations who might not work together because they're, they're doing different things or in different sectors? How can we help grow the learning in an authentic way without being prescriptive. I don't want to say, well, you're going to work with this organization to do your strategic plan, or you're going to hire this accountant, uh, and I, because this is, this is what I think that you need to do. It, you can, as a funder, I believe you can make suggestions, and you can't uh, be um, paternalistic in your expectations of your funding. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. So, Deep, um, are there other ways that Liana and the foundation have supported the internal life and organizational health of Keshet? Um, I mean, I think, you know, as Liana has indicated, there's been this, you know, initial and really just growing bedrock trust, um, you know, that we have felt. And, um, you know, and I can say that you know, certainly, you know, there are, there were earlier iterations of Keshet that were less robust and less healthy. And certainly, I don't know what the opposite of a tight ship is, a loose ship. <laughs> Where does that metaphor go? But in any case, um, so, you know, and thankfully, you know, we had other funders, you know, the Schusterman Foundation, um, you know, that, you know, you know, was, was a partner in those years. And so, um, you know, I think, we, you know, there is a growing ecosystem of funders who understand the value of multi-year general operating support. Um, and that said, um, you know, overnight, I mean, no, no other funder has done for us what Krupp did, which was overnight go from, you know, a $10,000 a year grant, which, you know, wasn't considered, you know, such a meaningful grant for the foundation, um, you know, to an over, you know, two hundred fifty thousand dollar a year, um, uh, you know, multi year grant, and um, you know, and that you know happened. You know, I didn't, I didn't know the the piece around Liana's father in law, George Krupp, basically kind of anointing her <laughs> with you know the LGBTQ mantle. Um, but I saw the fire for this cause in her when we talked. Um, and, and George similarly had said to me when I went to meet with him, wanting to interest him in making a larger investment in Keshet, he said, the person you really want to talk with is my daughter-in-law. So, so he, you know, was clear about the shiduch he was making. Um, so, you know, so that trust, you know, has just been critical, you know, and that trust has enabled, um, you know, Liana and me and in our interactions to, um, you know, for the, for the power differential that is there, um, you know, to be acknowledged and comfortable and, um, you know, and, and, you know, and not something that um, really kind of ever gets in our way as a stumbling block. Um, I mean, so much so that, um, you know, a, I think it was a year or so ago, um, you know, there was, you know, some movement within the foundation board, you know, to want to perhaps you know, move on from, you know, kind of graduate uh, certain grantees, you know, which is very common for funders to do so that they could focus on other grantees. Um, 
you know, and I just approached Leon, Liana very candidly and told her kind of how damaging it would be and how vulnerable it, what, what a vulnerable position it would put us in, you know, overnight for us, you know, to lose, you know, you know, $300,000 a year of funding, um, you know, and talked a lot about, you know, how, you know, this is work that is, I hope, going to be part of this family's legacy, you know, that this family can be a part of, you know, I hope, you know, someday, you know, it, I don't know, in our lifetimes, but, you know, in the foreseeable future, you know, Keshet working itself out of existence, um, and that I hope that that is a legacy that they would um, not want to divest themselves of. And so that was a conversation that I was able to have in a forthright way, um, and that couldn't happen without, you know, um, with, without the trust that we've built over time. So there's a way that by taking this relationship and having it be so much more than a transactional relationship, um, the work that you're doing is not transactional. The work that Keshet's doing is not transactional and um, the investment can't be either. So there's a way that the relationship leads to um, sustaining the ongoing work because of how the two of you have treated your relationship. Yeah, and just okay. to add on to that, it that conversation and that that sort of pause that Adit gave me uh, of maybe six grantees that are sort of part of this initial multi-year large dollar cohort, Jewish and non-Jewish, was the only executive director who pumped the brakes um, and, you know, was very honest about it. And it's a continued conversation because I realize that I need to do the work internally with my board uh, about uh, a both and model that, you know, the justification is, oh, we did great, we, we, success was had, however success may be defined. Um, and so now it's time to move on so we can have wins with other organizations and allow other people in. And, you know, I, I look at this as something that we can sustain and bring new folks up and not, and to no detriment of either or. And I, 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 I really wanna break that either or thinking um, on, on the board level and, um, and to Ajit's point of like what really, really centered legacy in, in what we're doing here and thinking about how long-term support um, becomes gold standard for us in our, in our giving and not just sort of that, oh, great, you do five-year grants. Maybe you do a three-year sunset and a small continued gift in perpetuity like how like that that feels like the right model for some organizations but that might not be the right model for all organizations especially when you we have taken leadership roles in organizations that being said full disclosure i'm also on the cash it board um for the past two years i am the uh chair of the development committee as well as a co-chair of our 20th anniversary campaign celebrating indeed's uh, leadership. So I think not that I think that uh, large dollar uh, funders uh, need, should demand or even deserve a place within lay leadership in an organization. But I do believe that as a funder, you do, especially at this level, you do need to take a greater interest of time um, and social capital in an organization to really, um, really double down on the dollar investment as well. So part of what you're saying there, it sounds like, is that the reason to be on the board is not because of the foundation's interests, but it's about continuing to support the organization from that perspective. And I've, I've been thinking as you've both been talking about how when we think about relationships, usually we don't think of them as time limited. You don't think I'm going to become, I'm going to build a relationship with someone, but in five years, I'm probably going to transition and, and find somebody else that I'm going to invest my time and care in, right? I mean, I understand this is not a personal relationship. It's professional, but I think what you're doing is challenging the notion of some best practices around funding for the benefit of the community. And that's uh, being explicit about what practices you want within this um, organization. So, I mean, yeah, I, I would say yes, for the benefit of the community, or another way of thinking about it is for the benefit of the impact you seek. Yes. You know, what is the impact that you seek to make? You know, it's interesting because I often, um, I have, uh, I'm looking for the word to replace impact in my own word because I always think of it as, you know, there's this sort of, what is it we're trying to do that is that is creative 
um, and I haven't yet found it in the field. So I often replace for for the community or for, but it's absolutely right. It's not just, um, it's, it's for people and it's for purpose, right? Um, so you did, you talked a little bit about the power dynamic ED and I'm curious if there's something you've learned from this relationship, either of you, that you've then worked to replicate in other relationships where you're the grantee or grant maker around being um, explicit around the power dynamic around, um, and I should say, we know that there's a power dynamic inherent in relationships that involve money or resources. Um, so how do you address this with other folks that you work with or do you? Have you found new ways to work through these dynamics with others as well? Um, for me, I wouldn't say it's new. Um, you know, I don't know if it's because I started out as a community organizer or, you know, because I have a little, because I'm Israeli American and have a chutzpah spirit in me. But I mean, I feel like I have been, um, you know, I hope respectfully and kindly, um, at times gently, at times, you know, with, you know, a bit more forcefulness. Um, been addressing these dynamics with funders, um, and, you know, not, a, not every funder, I mean, not, not every funder is, is willing to go there, um, you know, at all, but, um, you know, but I, I, in my experience, many, many, many do, um, and, you know, I mean, I think that just as, I mean, in Keshet's work in general, you know, our approach is, you know, we meet people where they are, and then kind of, we invite them to go further, and we invite them to be their better selves, and, our experience is that more often than not, you know, people rise to the challenge. Not always, but often. Um, and you know, and that it's similarly my, and that's similarly my experience with funders um, in terms of you know being candid. Um, if I feel like there's tension there, um, addressing it. If I feel like something doesn't feel fair, or doesn't feel equitable, addressing it. Um, and generally, that's met with appreciation. I think uh, you know it. It's very for I, I'm in a very fortunate relationship here with Kesha. I um, I don't think we as funders we often talk about how awkward being a funder can be, um, especially when you're in sort of mixed company of nonprofits and and other funders or just nonprofits of you know you immediately become and this is very gendered, but like the prettiest, smartest, funniest woman in the world, in, in the whole room, because they want to capture your attention. Um, I, it's really uncomfortable. It's something that I've sort of learned through experience to not always trust that. And I think uh, for me, the authenticity in our relationship is like, a, I was never treated that way. And Adit and I have had conversations where uh, you know there might be some some caution or some pause about something that that uh, we may be discussing. I'm like, oh, are you? Is it because I'm a major funder? And she's like, I don't think of you that way. So we were talking. We were just we were kind of prepping last night. I'm like, you don't see a dollar sign over my head, and that you as a funder, you kind of know who does and who doesn't. And um, I really appreciate that. And I think that there needs to be sort of more conversation, more open conversation about how uh, funders get approached sometimes, uh, especially when it's unsolicited, uh, because it, it, can, it can come off really aggressive. I've had people tell me that they wanna be my best friend because they heard me speak. Like, what does that mean? And like, you don't know anything about me, <laughs> but I do know that you had, you were, you're, on the development side for an organization. So I, I get it. And I think that, uh, you know, outside of this relationship that has always been respectful, um, particularly in, in where the power dynamic is very obvious when there's a race element, uh, I just put it out there. I'm like, let's address the elephant. I am a wealthy white Jewish woman and I wanna work with you. And I wanna do this in the most respectful way and in a way that you need not in a way that I see fit for our relationship. So it's really about putting it out there, moving past it and the deep listening and the, 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 the respect on the funder side to build that trust and, and to follow the lead of, uh, of organizations uh, to support in the way and to be as hands-on or not hands-on as, as they need you to. Hey, you're, you're pointing out something so important, Liana, which is that 
it's so frequent when we talk about changing how we work or looking at relationships to think about um, the humanity of the executive or the staff and the humanity of the person in the grant making position is also important. Uh, it is a difficult place to be and it's hard to know who your friends really are. And um, this is about um, shared humanity for everybody in the system, yeah. Um, I wanna say that we're gonna have time for questions. So if people have questions, they can drop them in the chat or if there's another way they should um, provide them, maybe Alana or Tamar, just tell people in the chat what to do with their questions. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit more and then we can open it up to questions that are specifically about Edith and Liana's relationship, about organizational health, about the grant maker grant seeker relationship or anything else that you're inspired to ask. Although I don't think any of us can comment on the purchase of Twitter today. So I would keep it, you know, sort of focused on this conversation here. Um, I, I want again to acknowledge that the two of you, so you have a personal relationship, your kids are friends, Liana, you're on the board. Somebody asked if that's common. Um, it's not, I, I would say it's less common, but it's an organization by organization decision, you know, what your governance policies are. And um, I guess I'm curious about even knowing that you have this, this special relationship, how you've taken what you've learned from each other and used it in other relationships. Relationship. So for example, Liana, I think you may leverage, um, you, you may work to leverage your relationship with ED to, to bring in other funders and other attention, but also, um, what else can you share with your colleagues to help them discover similar, authentic and transparent and healthy relationships? Maybe they're not gonna become friends like you are, but what can they take away that you haven't already shared? I, you know, Adid has been such an incredible resource for uh, how I navigate a new way of, of Jewish life and a new way of how we give in Jewish life. Um, and we were evolving sort of this, this uh, movement model in our giving that Adit has directly informed or has recommended folks to talk to. It's sort of a, a lot of these new grantees that are coming up, uh, Adit has or Keshet has some sort of connection with as partners or, uh, you know, we work with Join for Justice. Adit uh, was deeply involved there for many years. So I think that uh, from the funder side, utilizing the knowledge, connections, and advice of the grantee to meet and sort of gut check organizations that uh, could potentially come through your pipeline is a really uh, relational way of approaching uh, new grantees. And you know, from my end, I would say you know a key a key lesson to that all of us can never learn enough times is just you know, to remember to be human. Remember that kind of you are a human interacting with another human. And, you know, and again, I mean, I want to really emphasize um, my relationship with other funders is generally not, you know, you know not as personally deep, um, you know, as, as it is with Liana. This really is, you know, a special and exceptional relationship um, in that regard. But my relationships with, with the vast majority of our other funders are similar um, in the level of candor that exists um, when talking about our organizational needs, when talking about kind of what we need, um, you know, to accomplish together, um, you know, and so I think another another element here is, um, you know, there's so much there's so much about this relationship that is set up to um, put one in a transactional dynamic. Um, that you have to really consciously and actively resist the transactional aspect um, of the enterprise um, because you know it's it's set up to trap you in it, um, and so you have to really be aware uh, of how that ultimately doesn't serve you well, and it doesn't serve your organization well, um, and you know, and so you you need to be able to step outside of that. I really appreciate you saying that, Edith. And it and it does require being very explicit about what's happening, what you want, what you don't want. Have you found then that um, 
anything else is replicable in your relationship. You've got people here who are listening who maybe want to, to have this kind of transparency. Um, anything else that you would share that's replicable specifically? I mean, I would say the, you know, the piece that um, Liana and I both, you know, told the story from our, from our different perspectives around kind of what happened when there was the, you know, threat possibility of, of diminishing, of, 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 of diminishing support for Keshet. Um, you know, again, it, it, it doesn't happen every time, but in my, in my experience, kind of when you tell a funder, actually the thing that you want to do, you know, that's not that's not going to be the helpful thing. Let me tell you what will be the helpful thing, because because I mean, if you've identified, you know, that you share a certain purpose, that you share a certain vision of the world as it should be, and you're working to advance that together, um, then you're on the same journey, and they want to be on that journey with you, you know. So if you tell them actually, you know, you're veering us off, you know, you know, more often than not, they listen. Yeah. And I think that listening is a big part of it on the funder side. Um, and also this takes time. Adit and I have had a professional relationship that's developed over six years, which is not a long amount of time. And considering that I've only been professionally in philanthropy for seven years, that's a long amount of time in my career. Um, but I think that there needs to be genuine effort made. There needs to be genuine effort made to reach out um, beyond just questions about organizational matters. There, there needs to be demonstration of care. There needs, you know, I, recently I, uh, I found out that uh, a tree fell at a Dietz house through my auntie in Florida who works with the organizer of, from Kesha, who's in Miami. And it was the most like Jewish auntie thing possible of like, I'm like, Adit, are you okay? My auntie's telling me that a tree fell at your house. <laughs> um, very triangulated on the East Coast. Um, and it, you know, it, the fact that we're even like, that's how we, the, the worlds we move in are so, have become so interconnected in that way, didn't happen overnight. Didn't happen because we had a great lunch or because we, uh, we, our kids got along when we took them to dinner. And uh, I, I think that, um, you know, it, it's, and it's also being honest with yourself, like sometimes people don't mesh. We're super fortunate, we do mesh. Um, and, and just being on, and it's, you can still have a really valuable, meaningful relationship with someone that you might not have anything in common with that you work with and still be really human with them and still, check in with them when there's a loss in their family or to celebrate uh, uh, something happy that happened in their personal life, whether that's a birthday, a birth, a marriage, et cetera. And, and just also being aware of sort of in conversations like where people are at, following up and checking in like, hey, you seem really stressed today. Like, is there anything that I can do to help? Do you need to do you need to hold some space, like or have some space held for you to just vent? I always sort of, as a, a funder, sort of lead with like, I want to create a space for dreaming, but I also want to create a safe space that if there's a challenge that you, that you're able to share that with us, either in a sense of problem solving and helping you solve a problem, or that you just don't have a safe space, like a professional space to discuss those things in. So I think it's really some very some very human rules of interaction that can really build the relationship to be a, a, a more exceptional and transactional. Right, so these are ways that we're thinking about the workplace changing in general. There can still be boundaries around, it can still be safe, it can still be professional, but there's a potentially new definition of professional that allows people to care for each other, where the two of you don't have to necessarily have um, play dates with your children, but you could still be caring and interested in each other's lives and your welfare. So there are a few questions that have come through. Has asked about the framing of sustaining the team. Oh, tomorrow I'm turning it over to you for this part. So sure, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take this over just so that Amy, you can also be part of of this conversation. So thank you all. Um, it's been really interesting so far, and we have a few more minutes. So I encourage people to send to send their questions. So we'll start with this, is that um, mentioned that he really liked the framing of sustaining your team as part of sustaining the community. 
And how do funders support that beyond large multi-year um, general operating support grants? And I can send that to whoever wants to get us started. Great, Go Amy, thank you. Yeah, there are a few ways. Um, I know your next session here with Granted is about sabbaticals. And um, that's a very clear way you can support a team, not just for the executive, but you could have a sabbatical policy for the entire agency. Um, certainly multi-year operating support is a way to say, um, we believe that you're going to identify your long-term priorities and be able to work through them. Um, I think the, the element of, of flexibility when um, organizations think they know what they're gonna do in the next year or two, we all know it's gonna change. It does change and it doesn't only change because of pandemics. So what kind of flexibility can there be um, as priorities change and partnership as change happens? Um, and then I think on a fundamental level, the idea that overhead is a bad thing, I believe the opposite. I think investing in overhead general and administrative means investing in the people who are doing the work uh, and therefore maximizing impact. There, I said it, I said impact. Those are some of the things that I would suggest. I'm curious to hear from others. I think as a funder, um, you know, uh, in this example directly, Keshet already has a sabbatical uh, policy. There has been a lot of deep care and investment during COVID uh, around staff supports and uh, a lot of thought partnership with the uh, with the Keshet board um, and asking sort of like who, what other organizations do you see doing it right? And just like creating learning opportunities. But I think as a funder, um, especially if you're not on the board level, the way I am in this relationship is, um, is being flexible about those things uh, in terms of how an organization takes care of their, their team. Um, and because I think too, when, when uh, you see a lot of staff turnover, uh, you don't have a high morale, uh, that reflects back in the community about the organization. And I, I think that if you're able to encourage organizations to have those practices in place um, and be able to connect them with other organizations or professionals that can help them guide how to do things a little bit better is helpful. But as a funder, you, you kind of need to step back and, and allow the organization to do what is best for their they're the experts here of their own organization, not you. Thank you. Edith, is there anything else you would like to, to share? Okay, great. Okay. We only have a few more moments. Um, so I wanted to give each of you a moment or two to just reflect on a last message to the group. And I would say if you can center it, but you don't need to on, on a takeaway for everybody because we mentioned it before, especially Liana and Edith, your relationship is, is um, super unique and there's good parts and there's, there's boundaries that you probably have to think about a lot also in the personal and professional. So if there's other takeaways with that or, or anything else, I would love to hear from you and Amy, um, I'll let you close it out um, as well with your, with your last thoughts. So Edith, if you wanted to start, then we'll go on to Liana and then to Amy. Thank you. I was actually going to ask if Liana wanted to start and incorporate oh, sure. and, and incorporate responding to this question. Liana, do you ever ask grantees about their compensation policies? And do you see a role for funders in ensuring that grantees can provide appropriate compensation and benefits to employees? Well, thank you for that question. That's uh, that's definitely an important one in organizational health. That's a great question. And, and um, you know, in our due diligence process, we always ask um, uh, applicants for sort of their expanded budgets. Um, so we have a full understanding of, uh, you know, whether it's for profit or nonprofit, uh, payroll is often the most expensive part of the business, especially when you're service based and uh, you're run by people power and not product. So um, I, I'm currently doing a lot of work around sort of funding collaboratives to solve problems, solvable problems, like making sure that organizations are able to provide healthcare. Um, it, it, it really is an intimidating, benefits is a very intimidating uh, process for smaller organizations and larger organizations alike. So 
I am not necessarily uh, an HR professional or expert, but understanding how, what percentage of budget is going towards those things and, um, and just asking some really um, targeted questions around uh, how, how things may change, what, what they would like to sort of shift in what they offer. Um, I definitely have worked with organizations that did not offer benefits and just had a paid salary. Um, you know, and, and seeing where that is a, as a priority for organizations too um, is very telling. So if you're, if you're putting your programs in front of your people, you're not necessarily, um, it's not always the best, the best foot forward. Yeah, I mean, I would say from my perspective, it, it generally is not, and it generally means uh, your organization will end up limping very soon. Um, and you know, on, I mean, on 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 that note, I you know, I've really appreciated that, you know, over 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 the years, I think it used to be when I was first starting to build Keshet twenty years ago that it was more the rule that funders would say we want to fund program, we don't want to fund you know, we don't want to fund operating support. Um, and, 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 and I think slowly that, you know, that ratio is flipping, thank God. Um, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, to other, you know, CEOs um, on this call, like, I, I think, like, we really have a responsibility not to hide infrastructure, not to hide the machinery, which keeps it moving, because otherwise nothing is possible. Um, and that I see that as an important ongoing funder education piece and something that funders can do um, you know, to educate one another. Um, and, you know, going and moving back to our, to the relationship, um, you know, re regardless of whether there is an actual personal spark between people, regardless, regardless of whether there's going to be a personal connection, um, it's so critical to find the spark that is about, that is about shared purpose, um, because that's why the funder is in it with you, um, you know, or that's why the grantee is, in there with you as as you know as a funder, it's because you have some shared vision um, of where you want the world to go, um, and you know so to kind of you know break down this you know dichotomous relationship of of grantee and grantor while recognizing that yes you know there is a power differential there, so I'm not saying pretend that doesn't exist, but understand that that exists and integrate it into the totality of a relationship that is about together moving our community, uh, moving the Jewish world uh, to a better day. Great, thank you. Um, and Amy, I, I know we're just at time, so I'll give you, it's a hard job, but to uh, end us off today. I think if I were to offer one final takeaway, I would invite everyone on the call to notice as you navigate moving from one conversation relationship to another, you're talking if you're a funder and you're talking to a colleague who's a funder and then you're talking to an executive director who's a prospective grantee or current one or talking to a staff member or you're an executive director talking with a board member and then a staff member and then a funder are you changing how you relate to each person can you bring the same self the same values the same interpersonal practices to each of those relationships that is where you begin to notice the humanity across the system and apply the same values across the system. So I would notice when you're shifting and see if you can be the same in all of those relationships. Great, thank you so much. So many pearls of wisdom that just came out in the last three minutes that I was like noting down here about people power and humanity and finding that spark. So thank you so much. Um, Liana and Edith and Amy and for all the people behind the scenes that helped us get this together. Um, and for everybody that participated, our next granted webinar is on May 19th. Like Amy mentioned, um, it's from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern, 9 to 10 um, specific time. And it's about rest and rejuvenation, the importance of sabbaticals in the Jewish nonprofit sector. We will send out information about that, but I will also put it in the chat right now for you to quickly um, register. So thank you all again for for your time and sharing your your knowledge and your and your thoughts with us and thank you everybody for participating. Have a great day. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Take, take care. care. Take care.